believe a, a, it was as data-based as we could make it. And if we didn't think of that, they all asked so many questions that, that it became, I hope that feels fair. Uh, and then we uh, developed a vision. So the vision really came at the end of the process, not the beginning. Uh, and it was clearly building on a vision, of course, that the Red Ribbon Commission had developed. So it, it, it was probably, I'd say, refining and expanding on that vision. And that is being translated into zoning recommendations and non-zoning recommendations. So uh, with that, uh, the, I want to read to you, so you can all read the words, but so, so the first bullet is about the fact that diversity matters so much to everybody that's been involved in this process, whether they're on the committee or not, or somebody I would run into, or you when I've got a chance to present to you before, and that's about race and economics and age and lifestyle. Central Square is I mean, the essence of Central Square is its appeal to a very broad mix of people all at the same time. And, and actually a changing, I should say, and a, have a place that has a changing face at different times of the day, into the night, and weekend versus week. And that's, people really value that. Nobody complained about too much noise at night from a club or something. They, they wanted the mix. Um, <clears throat> that it's a place that uh, is about uh, old about preservation, but it's also a place where people really want to sort of celebrate the new, have vitality. Somebody talked about, a couple of members talked about really making art, not art, but art and technology uh, a really important part of the, the, public, the public realm, the public face of Central Square. Uh, people, we, I can keep saying people, because it's really a, very much a, a group effort. We talk a lot about being real about things. So one reason we spent so much time on the economics of what we were talking about is folks really, really wanted to believe, you know, wanted to make sure that we were creating something that was achievable and therefore meaningful. Uh, so uh, we talked about uh, a lot about what's happening to housing markets and what's likely to happen over the next maybe 15 years, uh, given the tremendous shift towards preference for urban living and there's only so much housing in Central Square and a lot of people want something it becomes more expensive um, and the profound desire to maintain the diversity of the place. People didn't even say so I could live they just said so it can be a diverse place and so we, one of the things we spent the most time on I think was making sure that we were being real about affordable housing and, and we'll talk more about this but uh, providing as much housing as we could uh, uh, opportunities to create a, a usually large share of affordable housing and also looking at sort of middle income housing, folks who uh, don't qualify for subsidies conventionally but can't afford to live in much of Cambridge, certainly Central Square. Uh, and <clears throat> we talk a lot about the, the public realm. I mean, this, since in many ways Central Square is two people, Massachusetts Avenue, it's, it's also, of course, the neighborhoods around. And, the sense here is, was not to sort of decorate Mass Ave, or even to landscape it, or even to add trees. All those things are positive, but to really build on its role as a public space that really drew people to engage each other, small groups or large groups, that, that was actively the center of the community. It is now, but even more so. Uh, so, this. the vision statement is essentially Central Square is Cambridge's downtown a center for nearby neighborhoods, a vibrant culture, cultural district, a sustainable urban environment that invites people from all walks of life to shop, live, enjoy entertainment, and the arts, find communities together, and more, and I should say all in the same place. So I will quickly walk through the framework, and again, please ask me questions, because I, I may skip over something of great interest, and if other people feel I'm saying the wrong thing, please correct me. So, um, in a place that is, diversity is wonderful, and diversity, of course, well, actually diversity is not always a source of complication, but it, there, there are challenges to solve here about a, a mass app that's as vital and diverse as possible, and neighborhoods that uh, not only have a smaller, much more fine-grained scale, but also are quieter places, more residential places. Um, uh, and so, uh, to really find the right balance and the way to change, to transition from uh, Mass Ave to Jason Edwards, uh, really commanded a great deal of time and effort. Um, the uh, Osborne 
a triangle uh, is, in many ways, presents similar but, but very different opportunities and challenges. It is directly across the street from a clearly very valued uh, public housing development, whose, some of those residents certainly got involved in the Moorhead, uh, and yet uh, a block away uh, there are uh, new life science uh, technology buildings. So here transition becomes really important and bringing a place more to life for public housing residents and employees nearby and work for both is a complex but I think it's a useful challenge. So, uh, <clears throat> the uh, broad approach to uh, new zoning, to the vision, to the plan, to the framework, when Helen looks at it, is to say that the heart of Central Square is uh, basically from, from Osborne Triangle, from uh, Jill Brown yes, Park, uh, and um, uh, to Central City Hall, and that it is very much a, a matter of sort of a, a, a linear conception. There are uh, there is a heart of Central Square, which is not a place. Uh, it's not a, a circumscribed place. It is it is in fact a corridor of life and activity along Mass Ave. And then there are very conscious uh, transition zones to either side. Now that that's use and character and height and all kinds of things. And then the Osborne Triangle presents a very different set of opportunities and challenges. It is certainly not intended to be an extension of Kendall Square. It is not a place that can be, I think, achieve what it should if looked at in the same way Central Square is looked at. It needs to be looked at very neatly, and it too has a very important uh, neighborhood edge uh, that requires a very careful sense of transition from uh, what is happening in the rest of it. So one of the things that we spent a lot of time talking about is, well, where did the change happen? And so um, we are operated under the <coughs> premise that uh, urban, because a lot more folks want to live and work in urban areas, and you've all seen this in Cambridge, but just to restate, that we're, uh, the uh, real estate economy is, how should I say, going to make things possible and also try to do things that it probably hasn't for uh, even over the last decade before the recession, certainly for the 50 years before that. So, so that properties <coughs> that may not have been likely to change now could. And there are several ways to look at this. One is we have a very dynamic institution, MIT, that owns a lot of property, certainly in the Osborne Triangle and next to it. And um, they as an institution are clearly uh, thinking at all times about how to maximize the value of their holding. Uh, we have other larger owners. Um, this property, of course, uh, uh, this Quest property was, was recently bought. We have, and I'm going to skip over the, this call for a minute. We have um, parking, the publicly owned parking lots where the city could decide to be the, the sponsor of change because there are, it has opportunities that probably hasn't had in, in its history for those parking lots. And then we have properties a little more, and there are a couple of private apartments. Then we have properties a little bit more complex. So here is somebody named Boris Magar who owns some property with public parking lots either side. So a partnership there between the city and that owner could unlock all kinds of opportunities, or the lack of partnership could keep things the way they are, or the owner could do something more modest on his own. So that's something to, to think about, and it, and it gives the public, uh, the community, a uh, real uh, voice at the table in thinking about the future of that site. On the other hand, there are other lower buildings that frankly have are multiple owners, small sites, and it's really hard to imagine their redevelopment in the foreseeable future. Uh, it just certainly <coughs> expect in the lifespan, lifespan of this plan because it just isn't economic. Uh, you need to build several times the FAR of a building to redevelop it and it's just not achievable on, on those sites, particularly given parking things. So, can I ask a quick question? Oh, of course, yeah. The, so, do you know, um, could you just <coughs> you know, put it out on the map where the rest of the lower west properties are? Oh, gosh. Um, uh, Iran or Ben, you could probably do it more. If this parcel is the yeah. main quest building. Um, here are the, this parcel and this parking lot are uh, part of their ownership as well as the parking garage, which is right here, and then um, a parking lot that's here. 
So you would note that the plan which emphasizes the sort of heart of Central Square and residential transition would say very different things about not only different holdings, but different part of their main building. I, I think uh, there is another building on Mass Ave. Uh, there is uh, a big part of the Quest Carpenters, too. So we have on uh, sort of the Radio Shack block. Yes. And the lot. That's behind. right. That's so, right. So no, you're I, right. I, I, that's you're too right. much to leave out. That's right. No, that's right. It's on. It's right here. That's right. Here. It's the barn now. The Radio Shack. Radio Shack. It is Radio Shack. Yes. It, it's also a larger scale site. It, uh, sorry. There's also more development on that site already. Mm -hmm. So is there less and, and there's a large uh, lot. We had not originally picked that as one of the. Uh, sites for change, but when you think about all this, the quest holdings together, I think that makes sense as identifying that full set as possible change. It, yes. Isn't the number 12 sites? 12 parcels. 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 Yes. Yeah, there's several parcels in each of those clusters. I mean, from the analysis we did, this is where significant development could occur. Uh, there's as a, lot of, a lot of value in that piece, and these are clearly much smaller and, and certainly should lend themselves to infill development. So they're going to need a broad strategy. So <clears throat> the vision framework then uh, uh, boils down to a mixed use emphasis uh, in the core of Central Square with transitions to the neighborhood, uh, and that same focus would extend, I think, into. Uh, uh, the, uh, part of the uh, Osborne Triangle, and then it sort of meets a more research-oriented uh, mixed-use area, which again should have a very different character than, than Kendall Square. Uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is break. Can I ask another question? Just, of course, yeah. Just quickly, what do you think is the difference between pedestrian-friendly ground floor and central versus Kendall? How, how would you? Like? A uh, pedestrian-friendly ground floor, I don't think, would differ very much. Uh, I think the um, scale of buildings, uh, the permeability, the public access through, would be very different. Does that answer your question? Uh, I, I'm sorry. There, no, there is more. I, I'm, I'm, okay. I think also in Kendall Square, there is there has not been a perceived public interest, for example, in. Uh, uh, Creating opportunities for small retail, I mean, it's a, it's a good idea, but, but for small retailers to preserve existing businesses, uh, to uh, encourage developers to uh, bring in uh, sort of new, small, unique businesses, et cetera, and to negotiate with them. In all of this area, that's a very important goal. You're, you're looking, I'm, I'm if I'm making things worse than better. But. Um, I think that that has actually been, uh, the, the reason that David is not pointing to Kendall as having those aspirations is because a lot of that is happening already and because the existing framework doesn't, I mean, there aren't a lot of existing businesses to preserve, whereas here there are and, and there's a lot of people who are very attached to those businesses, so that is a, big, a much more significant goal here than in Kendall Square. I only ask a question because it sounded like you were trying to make a distinction between the pedestrian experience in Kendall versus Central. But I might have misunderstood. No, actually, that, that, I'm sorry, that, that wasn't the intent, but you did remind me that I think we have a much more sort of fine, we've taken a much more fine grained attitude towards the street level public experience in Central Square and as part of the Osborne Triangle, simply to repeat what Ron just said in terms of the variety of businesses. and and economic range they might serve because of the really fundamental emphasis. Diversity is a welcome value anywhere, but it is absolutely no pun intended central to the character and spirit of this area. Doesn't it also relate to the floor plate of the businesses that in Kendall, you're never going to have a, a fine grain of business that is Finer and, yeah. um, and I mean, something that I think everybody loves. You, you, so, could, yeah. you could be 
require in Kendall Square that all four, that, that uh, retail uh, floor plates be no larger than 1,000 or 1,500 square feet, and you probably wouldn't get any retailers show up because they need a much more sort of vibrant um, uh, environment. Uh, but also the buildings don't lend themselves. Here in the lot of existing buildings, they very much lend themselves that fabric. Mm -hmm. Well, we haven't received the <coughs> details on the Kendall Square, mm -hmm. like a, a zoning petition, but mm -hmm. we certainly spend a lot of time with the NMIT petition, mm -hmm. and that is clearly what we're trying to do on the mm -hmm. first floor, create small spaces so that the retail is activated. <coughs> and that's, so that's my sense of what we're trying yeah. to yeah. push MIT and their petition to put forward. So that's why I'm yeah, I'm sorry. That okay, on Main Street, I'm, I'm keeping myself on Main Street and given Main what Street MIT is doing, that's yeah, a huge part of the that, that makes complete sense and it's fully achievable there. I was thinking more of the more scattered retail elsewhere. But I, I think, as I heard the question first, it was like, you know, well, what, why would you distinguish between small retail and capital mm -hmm. etc.? And my own answer would be, well, you would distinguish because each is really a unique square, as is Harvard Square, as is Portage for you, so it wouldn't be the same just because those places yeah. are distinctly <coughs> different. I think in, in Central, as we heard from Henry Fernandez, who came out to the Red River, who mm -hmm. was running for mayor of New Haven, so mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. But he really looked at Central Square and said that, you know, we have removed many, many of the historic facades. So, so there was even more character that we have over, that has over time been removed. As you go down to Kendall, uh, we're about to have a discussion about the three remaining buildings that may have any connection to history at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so your basic, uh, what you're working with from the beginning is this mm -hmm. thing I think uh, most of your particular comments seem to line up with what the Red Ribbon call amplification. We want to amplify what's there and we want to curate with mm -hmm. so you get curious of what to her. Yeah. And, and so I would have you go further. Okay, thank you. I should have asked you to answer the question. I would say curate is much more relevant in Central Square than at Kendall, where it seems to be new and exciting. Okay. All right, so, um, and now we'll talk a bit more in detail about these things. So, uh, there were really four uh, core goals that underlay this vision. One that, and, and these speak to the different dimensions, the, in some sense, the diversity of Central Square. Place to live, <coughs> it's a public place that it builds, but it really invites community, uh, creates reasons for people to come together. Uh, it is a place of retail, culture, nonprofit diversity, but this falls a lot into its sort of role as, as a downtown for Cambridge, as well as a center for the neighborhoods nearby. And it is a place that um, probably needs to be better connected. There needs to be, there needs to be better connections between the, the uh, case of neighborhoods and the square that make more of a sort of a walkable scene between them. Uh, and that has to do with uses and, and, and design, a number of things. So, as a place for living, uh, I think the primary objective was to expand the, the number of housing units, the number, of, and therefore the number of affordable housing units, and the range and types of housing available to folks in who live right in the square or nearby. And I should pause for a second because uh, this had to do with a lot of information we had over. Uh, who was going to be looking for housing in Central Square, and uh, certainly will be families looking, but there will also be a lot of people who are empty nesters and millennials who seem to be getting older and older, uh, who just really want to be in a lively place that offers a sense of community. And we have a choice. We can either accommodate them or they'll go competing with folks who already live here, and we felt accommodate was better. Um, so some of the things we talked about uh, were, first of all, uh, making sure that we weren't burdening this housing with parking requirements that, frankly, um, cost a lot, particularly because you, uh, in effect, literally require low-grade parking in terms of how you treat FAR, and, and but nice to free up those dollars for other things, maybe affordable housing. 
uh, that inclusionary housing, this is never really a question, but we emphasize that very much in the spirit of Central Square. Um, let me come back to the third goal in a minute. Uh, add more housing in the Osborne Triangle and sort of quest block to sort of reinforce the sense of neighborhood around the um, public housing community. So more sort of an integrated, in, more integrated for the life of Central Square. Then uh, a, there was a lot of conversation about middle income housing. This was probably the area where people were most interested in accommodating families with kids. And it's the sense that, uh, and, and this is quite well known to all of you, so I won't spend time on it, but that it was time to really do something to make some difference around the fact that there is uh, sort of category folks who just can't afford to live in Cambridge and, and everybody wants them to to continue to be part of certainly the Central Square community. And so um, uh, one of the uh, prime values, uh, when, if we're going to grant people density or other, height or other incentives, was to require back um, middle income housing. And we can talk more about that if you want details, in which case I'll also rely on Iran. But um, that was, uh, I think, a very strong intent. And not at the expense of the traditional affordable needs, in addition to. Um, so, uh, as a public place to build community, uh, this is really about making Mass Ave an inviting place um, uh, that offers a range of activities that appeals to lots of different kinds of people at the same time or also over the course of the day into the night. There should be lots of, it's not just, it's a bench, a tree, and, and a nice sidewalk aren't it. It is a bench, a tree, a fountain you want to sit next to, uh, somebody who's performing, so you might start talking to the person next to you about, isn't this cool, or, and, and attract certain kinds of people. It's, it's a place that really offers invitations, and we, we'll talk more about how to do that. Um, uh, a lot of it has to do with programming, and, you know, boy, the, the take advantage of the fact that, that the uh, cultural district has been declared, and, and the uh, business association is getting more and more active to, to really encourage them to take on that role and to build on the cultural district designation uh, and ensure a positive relationship with the new job. Basically, make sure that if anybody creates anything new, it enlivens the public realm around it. There just can't, it goes way beyond the blank walls. It's the activity. <clears throat> no banks next to a square, for example. Get to that level. So, can we, can we do that? <laughs> Seriously, I mean, that seems to be. Can you get to the level of no banks? And yes. um, well, Ron's going to say no, so I have to say why we can't. Yes. A bit, a, 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 as far as I know, officially we can't. But I mean, some I banks, but in I say this. I don't know of a development in Cambridge that isn't negotiated. And, you know, we talked about zoning and non zoning recommendations. So, some of these are things that you may not, and then I'll look at Ron correctly. Uh, may not be legally possible, but there are two communities I know in this world that exert a, as a lot of influence and are really willing to engage developers in positive way, you and Arlington, Virginia. And, um, and I think the, the more guidance this can provide to that process is a value. Does that make sense? Yeah, but the thing you have to understand, and no, you cannot, I don't believe, mm -hmm. legislate no banks mm -hmm. because it's the reason why, and I think we've been really uh, forward thinking in this. We've, we've tried to the extent humanly possible to involve the people who own the buildings because ultimately yeah. they make all of the decisions. Sure. And the banks pay a lot of rent and they sign long leases. Mm -hmm. So you show me a bank, and I'll show you a happy uh, building owner. And, and, and my personal one, I don't care for his phone store. I don't have it. Many banks move yeah. where there's money. Yeah. Uh, and it's better to be in a place with money as opposed to one without money, in mm -hmm. my opinion. But I do think uh, we had to learn in these processes that we have building owners who own significant parcels, I'm thinking now like uh, 675 Mass Ave, who do not necessarily remember that they own that and make rental decisions completely uh, that we would never want. Mm -hmm. So we have to continue to connect with the landowners, otherwise we're just talking. Mm -hmm. 
I think that's really true. And, and frankly, to have a good friend in the business association adds another dimension to your ability to engage them. Now I'm gonna ask my colleagues. Ordinarily, um, we don't recognize the public, and I think we're still, still not recognized in the general public, but we have with us at the table members, members of Center Square Committee, and I think we can consider them part of the uh, presentations, uh, if that's okay with But Matt and Mayor, I think what you mean to say is that we always recognize the public. However, <laughs> 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 in this instance, we're at a round table, yes. and a round table is set up by the council to be an informal back and forth discussion with the council is engaged in with experts and others it invites. The public normally doesn't comment at these, but if there's some little time at the end, it may be possible, but these are also supposed to be two hours and go home. Well, I think, I think that, that what I'm saying is the distinction between the presenters, who include uh, the members of the committee, and I think Iran intended for us to see them as part of the presentation. Is that right? In fact, they want to take turn sitting here. <laughs> that was not at all. Okay. So, um, uh, please introduce yourself and, um, yes. Uh, my, my name is Patrick Barrett. I'm on the committee on CNI. I'm the Intermediate Center of the NSW SG But just to chime in on that last bit about not being able to pull out banks, you're right, Councillor. You can't say specifically to Bank of America you can't come here. But what you can do in cultural district is say we can inform the businesses that are allowed here, which would include your cell phone companies, which would include your banks. And that's something you can do. I, I missed the word you said. We have no formula business? Formula businesses. Which is the definition that uh, is applied in Nantucket um, and other, other places like that want to preserve the cultural aspect of the district. And this is actually one of the recommendations. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Council Baker and then Council Kelly. Yeah, and then Council Kelly. I, I wasn't sure if people were just jumping in, but I think I could probably help get everybody in. Yeah, Council Baker. I guess what I would say is I think there are communities, and I don't know if it's through this, you know, a cultural, what did you call it? A cultural, cultural district. A cultural district. Yeah. Right. There are communities that have zoning to try to keep out various businesses like that. Um, and I think it is absolutely something we should look at because for the very reason that Council Slowry is suggesting that we may have owners who are not paying attention to their property here. Well, it's our job then to make sure that um, while they're while they're so not attached to the relevance of their property, um, we're attached to, we're more attached to their property and, and what the usage is. So I, I would like to see actually the CDD come to us with a list of possible ways, in fact, to zone, um, to zone or regulate um, how we, in fact, can really have more of a narrative and control of sort of what gets developed here. Thank you. Oh, please, I think we're going to have to respond. Yeah, I, um, well, okay. Um, I think that's great. Um, and I think it is the formula business sort of approach, which we did talk about, and I should have mentioned it, that is the one I'm most likely, I'm, I'm most aware of. But the only thing I would note is that um, uh, it's, it's sort of a postscript to Council Reeves' comment. Uh, I man, ended up on the Urban, uh, the Urban Land Institute jury for three years. So around the country, looking at big projects. And it's really interesting. These are bigger projects, bigger, very sophisticated developers, but they won't put a bank in. They will only put in businesses that raise their rents upstairs, and banks don't do that. Cool restaurants, places to hang out, music, the same stuff you'd like in Central Square, unique stuff. Uh, that, they make a lot of money off of that upstairs. And if we could somehow institutionalize that, maybe with the business associations help so that there was that broad awareness and that people realize that what's in, the building next door affects not just that person's rents, but your rents, and the rents on the other side of the building. And, uh, and I think that's a whole lot of sort of relationship building and sort of sharing responsibility in terms of raising everybody's values. That's not meant to supplant your point. I think it would be just great. Well, to but I think of an example of Harvard Square, yeah. where there was a space, lot space, sort of thinking of one in particular, where a bank was really courting one property, mm -hmm. the owner is, is in a position where um, he was able to not do that and actually work with another tenant. Um, but the neighbor said, hey, is that bank still looking? And then the neighbor brought the bank, is bringing the bank in right now. So I, I don't think that it's just about that. I think that there are always going to be property owners mm -hmm. that, for a lot of reasons, are going to be looking to bring the yeah. highest rent. And, and I don't judge them for that. Um, I'm just saying that I think it's our job to try to have a stronger narration of what we want. 
people in our community will look at and we use all the tools that we have. So I, I don't think it's just about the person who chose not to put the bank there who got less rent and actually invested money to allow them to sell their property and some creative ways of supporting that. That's about a relationship with the city and with various businesses. Mm -hmm. The other person, um, whether they have relationships or not, their priority is getting the highest rent. So I think it's not just about building relationships. I, I, believe me, I didn't mean to. to no, no, I'm just saying, so I think the council has that. to be. What I don't want us to do is to say, no, you're right, let's keep oh, building these relationships sure. and sort of pursuing that. I think it's a multiple yeah. prong approach. And yeah. I think we do have to be really aggressive yeah. around looking at ways in which we can mm -hmm. put into uh, regulation or to law mm -hmm. how we decide to track the businesses that we want. I think we've already we have a near consensus on banks and the council. I think we've already put in place in North Mass Ave a limitation on the amount of square frontage that a bank can have. And if we can cap the number of fast food restaurants in Central Square, I don't know why we can't cap the number of banks in Central Square. The idea of capping anything seems pretty clear that we can do it through the uh, table of uses. Uh, there's some very creative language in there about floor size, for example, being 2,500 square feet max for certain types of establishments. Um, I don't think any of this is groundbreaking. I think it's, it's supportable by law, and I think it exists to some extent in our current zoning, and I don't think that we can get a clearer picture from CDD about what kind of zoning changes might get us to where the council really seems to want to go. There's a, a bank in Ashmont, the Ashmont Station in, in Dorchester uh, that is a bank plus cafe. Okay, and it's, they were pushed. I, I was just going to say, if I were going to pick on uh, other uh, controls we might have, it would, it would be uh, the biggest enemy in Central Square has been property owners who leave Central Square retail banking for long periods of time. And they are both institutional and private ownership. And even when the ownership is active in what's going on, the vacancies persist. And, and that, in Central Square, is the biggest problem we have because the perception caused by those vacancies is that things are down at the heels. So as long as Blockbuster is vacant, there will be people who walk by there and make some sort of judgment about what's not happening in Central Square, despite the fact that there may be dynamic and dramatic plans for it. The same was true with the Moxa vegetarian <coughs> site. It just was vacant for almost five years. That's just too long to leave a first floor vacancy in an area that you want to be providing. So maybe the council should consider as well, or when you become as community development, with things to consider, Maybe we should invent a way to control the vacancy rate so that you, if you rent, if you don't rent your first floor retail in a certain amount of time, maybe you should have to pay or give it to us or something well, that was draconian. Something that happened in New Haven. Oh. Right? Well, so if you, were, if you were running a mall and that was going on, you would put up a sign and you'd say, under construction, or this is the plan for this area, and you would, and, and so the public that said goodbye wouldn't make assumptions that aren't true, first of all. I mean, for example, the H Mart is, everybody wants to know what's going on with the H Mart. Is there a sign up that says H Mart under construction expected to, it, it, when there's a, a unified approach to, to management of space, those managers seem to know you need to say it as an explanation. And I think that's something we could fix probably pretty easily. That's why speaking to the property owners to say, can you put up a sign saying, What's going on here? Or when do you expect this this to actually be uh, filled? I think you make a great point because H Mart, in fact, is rented. But if you walk by there, you still think it's vacant. Mm -hmm. It's well on track to come in online. In this thing uh, that we council gets from community development, we also might suggest that when first floor retail is vacant, it ought to have some kind of beautiful signage, art, or window covering, uh, as you even saw on Prospect when the brown paper fell down from the coming nightclub, it looked like the end of the world in that building. <laughs> so, so why shouldn't we have things that protect visually the area uh, in that way? I think we can do that. That seems to be within reach. Uh, the plan actually right now says, and, and you might all look at point this further, it's, it's not quite as, as 
determinate as the language for Kendall Square, but it says basically at six months, the plan says the city, the community development department should step in and help find somebody, an arts organization, just somebody who needs space for a while. Um, I would also, you know, you're sitting right in front of Cambridge Business Hotel, mm -hmm. that, that, what's that? Central Square. Central Square. Yeah. When I say, okay, that um, uh, I've certainly been aware, and I bet this, this would have more energy than whatever to do it, um, that they've acted as a broker to find somebody who needs space for a couple months. You know, children's art gallery. I mean, things that are really valid. We're not just, uh, that would love a really public location. So I think there are lots of ways to deal with this, and it's, it's certainly, and, and if an owner wants to wait for higher rent for six months or eight months, then it's really valid to put something else in there in the meantime. And, and you know, I just want to, it's not, it's not just good public policy. It's only fair to the other rest of the business community. Yeah. And the public. Yeah. And, and I, I just to leap back very quickly to the earlier discussion. One thing that's different now about that even than two or three years ago is there's much more recognition, at least the more sophisticated the developer, there's much more recognition of how much activity at the street increases value above. So that hasn't been a commonly accepted principle in past years, but it's something I think you can use now that wasn't available to you before. Okay. Uh, Saul? I'm Saul Penbaum, I'm a member of the committee. My name is, I mean, I'll, I'll stand second to no one in my heat of the banks and phone stores in Central Square, but um, before you know, we start talking about limiting business here, I think there's a, a first step, which is that I mean, the retail environment of Central Square has to be made stronger. It has to be made stronger by there being more people, and you, know, you make it stronger with more people by putting housing there. Um, I mean, it would be a shame to cap you know, banks and phone companies and still not have um, you know, a strong enough retail environment to attract other businesses. And I mean, that's, I mean, that's one of the things you know, we, we kept hearing in, this, in the committee process about you know, adding people to enliven the square. I mean, the square looks busy, um, but during the day, a lot of that is just simply people using it as a bus station, um, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I mean, Robin can tell tales of which restaurants are struggling to stay open at lunch um, or at other times, but there just aren't enough customers. You make customers by adding, you know, housing, and then, you know, you have a deeper retail base to build on. But Paul, it's not just a bus station because we had the MBTA to come to the Red River and they told us that Central Square is like the third most used station in their system. So if we're a, a Grand Central Station plus other bus terminal. So we do have people, but I think the thing if I if when Goody Clancy goes away until we have them come again, the thing that I want to tie to them, the big idea is that I know of is that we were not prepared in Cambridge to have a dense, bring more people, 4,000 more apartments to Kendall and 1,000 more in Senate. We, nobody living in Cambridge would have had that idea if you didn't come and say, if you want all this long list, list of things, then this you must do. And to my, to my mind, you're the first people who kind of put together all these locks and declared them not a good thing, and then suggested that those locks could result in more of the things that we say we want. Uh, so those were two big deliverables, because those are big ideas that we really, I had never heard of that we would be talking about our public parking lots, giving them away, building them away, how terrible they are. That all came as part of this discussion. Very good. Can, can I just, I, I just want to make sure, I know we have essentially just one more hour for this meeting, and I, I bet there's at least uh, two more hours worth of comments we'd love to make, but I think we should try to keep some discipline and make our way through the presentation. I'm so glad you stayed at six. Or we wouldn't <laughs> 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 regret saying that for many years. <laughs> um, so I think one thing, this is, so one, one, this is sort of symptomatic of what, an action that I think we talked a lot about, which is uh, uh, change in the form of a whole bunch of, in 
increased demand from more affluent people can be very scary and disruptive and destroy a community, or it can be a very powerful, powerful force to manage and use. And we chose, hopefully, course B. So it may be that people haven't looked at developing the parking lots before because there wasn't the strength in the market to really give you the choices you have now. But boy, do you have those choices. All right, so in terms of the public realm, which is sort of a jargony word, but I think sidewalks and parks and things, um, the one of the things, that, this is very much like uh, Kendall Square, uh, that it's not just public realm, it's particularly for diversity good matters, it's, it's a public realm that allows you to do a very wide range of things. Somebody, I think you were saying, we need a place to pause. Okay, which meant for a couple of people, just to sit down and have a conversation, they've just run into each other. Uh, they're out for a stroll and they suddenly want to sit and watch something. So, so places, you know, maybe that's where the bench and tree, just a place to, to hang out in a very sort of informal fashion can really make a difference. Uh, uh, public art can be a very individual experience or a whole class full of kids can walk up and down Mass Ave and, and, and learn from each other and then in the stories. Uh, outdoor dining is kind of a cliche, but boy do people love it. And, and it does all kinds of brings people together, it shows life. You can actually see the diversity of a place, you can see who's sitting on all kinds of things. Um, but then there are parks and festivals, and the parks and festivals can be more interactive or not, depending on how actively they're programmed off. But I think we all are in a much more diverse society. We don't tend to wander into the same place to do things with each other, because we have all different values and ways of living and all that. But if there's something we all like, then we come to it. Like, this is my a great kids play fountain will attract kids of every color and age, et cetera, and their yeah, and their parents come with them. I mean there are things that actually then invite community when it's harder to do. They used to do we used to build whole neighborhoods for Lithuanian Catholic steel workers. It's, that does not work anymore. So and given the diversity of Central Square, that puts an increasing, I think, responsibility on programming of parks. And I keep pointing to Robin, but to have a way between the city and the business association to really make sure this place is constantly inviting all kinds of people. So, uh, so. I just do an advertisement, which is for the Taste of Cambridge. What's the date, Robin? June 13th. June 13th. Last year's Taste of Cambridge in Central Square was an incredible, exactly what you said, mixture of people, excitement, and it was not directly in the square, but adjacent to it in, uh, in the yeah. University Park. It was a tremendous success, just really beyond, I think, anybody's expectation. We, we also have a poetry slam. And the Together Festival and the return of the World's Fair in a new and different form. So it's, it's cooking. Later I'll ask you what the return of the World's Fair is. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so there are opportunities for, it's basically here, it is making the most out of it for a very sort of rich mix of spaces. Here is a park that is probably that's the over. University Park. That's right. Yeah, yeah, this is the University Park. Okay, so this is so this is <coughs> in danger of being underappreciated um, and underused. So put it that way. But boy, is it offer opportunity. Yeah. And it has a wonderful owner post. I'm sure they're here. Okay. So um, and then a couple blocks away, we have Jill Brown Road Park, which is a very public, great sort of hangout place. And boy, with the right uses here, they're already happening. It's still tables out and great things, and more can happen there. And then here's a neighborhood park. And then each of these can and should be very different. And I'm, we can all still talk more about what this should be, but it's an opportunity to. Okay. Then here, if this can really be public, and it should, is, is a garden. It's a very different kind of experience. You know, along here, there should be a whole variety of experiences. Um, uh, could we create, if, if a major development happens here, could part of, I'll use a bullet term, the price of entry be creating a public group that just, and I'll show you, it just belongs to the community to do with what it wants. There are all kinds of the opportunities in what's here and likely to come. So. I just want to say, David, one of the things that happens in City Hall has like a microscopic lawn, mm -hmm. and it's a hill, oh, yes, and right. it's covered with children. Yeah. And, uh, and every afternoon, and there's a tremendous need from the daycare centers in the area for that kind of park space too. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they make use of City Hall lawn; it's, a, it's kind of a miracle. Yeah. But but I'm not sure that anybody spoke up for that need um, because we hear it every day here. Yeah. 
and, and I think that looking at some of these parking lots and so on or what have you, um, if you really truly want to be family friendly in some way, that, that's a crime you just said. That's that a really good point. And one of the things people talked about is there are a lot of people in Central Square who live in multifamily housing for the reasons we don't have yard. And in, in, they can't make snowballs and throw them at each other. You know, they can't lie out on the grass, etc. And City Hall Lawn is a great place to do things like that. Yeah, yeah, and it's, yeah. But it, you know. So, um, what I'm going to do is talk about a couple of the public spaces. And I think uh, Carl Brown Plaza has had a great deal of discussion. It certainly commanded a lot of discussion. And I'm going to try and sort of, I think, capture the core. There isn't anything that's happening there now that shouldn't be happening. It belongs to everybody. It's their incredible range of people, from people with no place to live, to people going off to a very high-priced job. I and mean, there are all kinds of things happening there. Um, but it doesn't, it's, in its current configuration, it's hard to host the community anyway. There's, there, there aren't reasons for the folks who live here and are part of the real Central Square community to be there very much. And uh, partly it's just the configuration. The, the sort of sculpture in the middle is kind of in the way of being able to use it. The, <clears throat> use the B word, the banks don't spill activity out. Um, uh, it's hard for people to circulate to the buses without moving right through the area where some activity could be occurring. And I, we actually felt, in a, in a not an ambitious way, that, that reconfiguring it to really program it, not so much in the idea of well, active programs could be carried out there, but to create places for different people to do different things that work, and frankly, we can at the end, uh, could make a very real difference. And, and, it, and nobody who's there now shouldn't be there in, in the future. Uh, Saul, in particular, I made a point I think that everybody really embraced, which is, it would also be a great place to, it has a very nice sculpture, and it should still be there, but to display the vitality of culture in Central Square by using something that is about art and technology. Yeah, and this is a place where Central Square could really announce you were as cool as it gets. And I and let's say as, as about as much about innovation as it gets as a community. Because that you know doesn't it's not visibly displayed. That'd be very good place. Uh, so then we come to Joe Brown Rome Park and, and um, this is a place that is felt to be uh, quite successful. It is quite successful. It was a, it was a really uh, great idea and successfully uh, carried out. Uh, probably it could be enriched, you know, uh, certainly, my gosh, uh, to the extent that the developers request property would come in and talk to folks, which of course we'll have to. Uh, there's a great chance to use leverage to have the most active interface and maybe programming responsibility, etc., for uh, uh, at least you know, more dining and stuff like that uh, in, in the park. Um, an opportunity for the business association or others to carry on some program activity for it. could have an area that works in the state. Just having electricity and lighting could be, could be used at night in kind of cool ways. Um, and then in some ways, this isn't the most, they're all, they're all most important, but the university, I, I think this should be called University Park Park, but um, <laughs> Park Plaza. Um, uh, I discovered actually from Robin and other folks here how much went on there. I had no idea actually. Uh, and I don't think this before, but certainly the folks from Forest City, I think it's fair to say, were very inviting of more community use and um, did not say that it's a space just intended for their tenants at all. Um, and uh, I think we talked about you know, wayfinding science to tell you how to get there, but it's just a great place to program and to really use for neighborhood activities because it's big enough, it's, it's quiet enough, it's, it's not right on, on Mass Ave. Um, and um, it's, um, it's, it, it's a potentially much more useful facility than it's been in the past, and that's not. Yeah, if I could say that, you said earlier that uh, one thing that is programming magnet is a children's park with a water feature. Yeah. Well, if there ever was a park that needed mm -hmm. children's fountain with a water feature, it was that. Mm -hmm. And back in ancient times, as that park was being retrieved, mm -hmm. I remember saying to the principals of Forest City then, mm -hmm. if you ever put a fountain back there like mm -hmm. the one and near the Pompidou Center with mm -hmm. the lips and the yeah. stone and all that, that, because otherwise, who knows it's back? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it would need to be a destination, but 
is, and you were saying, and you have this green space that kids can go to, they have preschools all around there, but they're not in that park. So it, it's, mm -hmm. these ideas need to join each other. You should, and have you, any of you have ever been over, walked over to the Christian Science Center on a summer day at the yeah. It's like a little United Nations. Yeah. It's just fascinating. And That's this way in pool and gray across. It, it is great. <laughs> Um, I don't even remember what it says, don't wait. Um, <laughs> and, and this is, I don't, I, I can't speak for four state, but I went, I'll come back to the UOI experience, which is talking to developers, but they kept saying, the developer at Land Warp started out with a much more privatized sort of public realm. You, the, the great atriums were not something the public could wander into. And they discovered their tenants wanted more people wandering through. They wanted it to be more alive, they wanted to be more city. And so hopefully we've entered an era where things that may have seemed like there were conflict aren't anymore. Um, so then we come to, to Mass Ave. Uh, and uh, at signature design elements, you know, things that really distinguish it. Uh, and uh, I think that's something that would deserve its own design study at one point. But it's, it's a pretty special place. And, and it's, Streetscape and street furniture and lighting, etc., are not, they don't, don't reflect that. Um, they're part of a Mass Ave quarter um, rather than the central square. Um, outdoor dining, I'm going to come back to parklets. I think public art should have a much more robust role here. And that's not just, that doesn't mean just put a nice sculpture up, that's a wonderful thing, but interactive public art. I mean, there are some things that are so dumb and simple as. They're, they're uh, lights that are embedded, uh, sit in the ground, basically, and you tap them and they change color and make music. So kids run up and down and they make their own, you know, that may not be what you want to hear, but they're just things that can really help bring the street to life. And thinking of, again, art and technology that tell a changing story. Well, the MIT Science Museum could certainly be a partner in that. Oh, that would be who, who, who has the job of making happen? So, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to keep going, but there is kind of magic to having a strong city, an active community, and a business association or a bid in the middle, they can accomplish more than any one for the long term. Um, uh, clearly making sure that all storefronts are, you know, the more interactive they can be. Uh, but I then want to come to parklets, and I think we've probably talked about that. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, so then the other thing that we talked about, this is in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And, okay, what's that? Oh, okay. oh, so the development corporation slash bid, uh, basically built this. And they built it in a very public location. Uh, it has, you know, a kitchen, so you can serve food. Uh, it's got electricity, lighting, etc. It's a beautiful space, and it is always being used by somebody, and it's hugely valued. And we, as we were thinking, this isn't a recommendation, we've made other places, that that Central Square in particular could use a space that literally belongs to the community to program. That um, there probably are spaces around you can use, but something that's just really delightful and cool, and with great connections probably to, to Mass Ave itself, so that Activity could wander out, but it is literally the community's room. And I suspect that you'll have development of such value that it could afford to provide this benefit. And in Kentucky, they have, uh, they have, I have a picture of one of those. Oh, wow. In okay. Kentucky, uh, an outside public market arcade, and um, I think it's perfect for us. We, we need such a thing, and we need to. But we need to put it into, I don't know, a development as a, as a, as a, um, on a menu of things that we want from a developer sure. to yes. provide, yeah. or that we put into one of our parking lots. But um, as I said, in Lexington, Kentucky, they use it as a public market some of the time, but the rest of the time uh, it could be used for other things. And uh, I mean, this is certainly a huge call for a space for a public market from us. And, mm -hmm. and they're beautiful, too, these things. Markets offer 
something for everybody. And all this discussion about price, price points, they, they, you know, there's something for everyone, indoor and outdoor. There, and also in DC, they have like unique things. So I brought back two lanterns from Istanbul that I have never seen anything like that here. And I was determined to get them on the plane and get them here. Mm -hmm. But my point is that on the market thing, we are really behind. There are other cities who have given themselves that gift, and it's, it's marvelous. The one, Eastern, is owned by the city of DC. DC owns three markets, mm -hmm. one of which is in Georgetown. Baltimore has a series of public markets that it's hard to be. They have trouble operating them. They don't really set up right, but they're equally. Good. I think they're always subsidized. Yes. Yeah. One nice thing about public market also is that it can really take on the, the no pun intended flavor of the community around it. So something in another part of Boston may be very different than what's here. Uh, we've talked about programming. This is from Asheville, uh, North Carolina. We're a master plan that really gets programming right, partly because every other person in the community wants to perform it, so, but, um, but you, I think have an awful lot of that here. I, I would bet anything, not Berkeley would provide students. Um, and then something that uh, I was really fascinated by, Parking Day. I haven't actually known a whole lot about Parking Day, and which was about creating, in fact, temporary public spaces out of, out of parking spaces that people did all kinds of things with, and it was really kind of cool. Um, and and the organization got very involved. Um, San Francisco has a very interesting uh, program where the city basically takes uh, proposals from businesses to create parklets. Uh, and this is an example of one right here. And um, they, I think, they they help design the furniture or whatever, and they'll sort of share in the funding, or sometimes the business funds it. What they're getting is the approval. But all these cool places pop up around San Francisco. A little, you know, a sidewalk that's a little too wide comes to life. Or there's an alley next to a building, and I can't think fast enough to figure out this. But I know in Central Square, people would find opportunities to do things with little bits of public space, and sort of interact with the business there, or the business association finds a reason to use it. And it may not be there for 20 years. Um, uh, it may be use, a use of a parking lot. Uh, may even be something that's there at some times of day and not at others. So a parking lot's empty, the activity comes to fill it. But, but the idea that we're, we're, what we're doing can be very much of the day, doesn't have to be permanent. So do you ever uh, get to talking here about how people actually want parking, but we want many of uses from the existing parking? Do you talk about how, we, how much parking we need to have and how it's going to be provided? I know it's pretty boring, but... Um, uh, yes. So I'll, I'll come to that, but, but it's, we're, we, we're probably more aware of the fact that people are likely to be driving less, so, but I will talk about that. So, uh, yeah. we, we did look at uh, parking, and I think in general, we don't, certainly don't think that the on-street parking, given all the other uh, things that are uh, programmed for it, things like Pumway, when it takes up, you know, those are kind of more important uses right now for Central Square, but there are a lot of sections in Central Square where the sidewalks are pretty wide, so we see that as a much much more real opportunity um, for these parklets in Central Square. I, uh, I, I hate to be an advocate for parking, but, uh, but in terms of the restaurants and, uh, and weekends and evenings, I, I don't see how they do survive without having parking. No, I agree with you. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not arguing the point, I'm just saying, as much as we might try to focus on the other things in parking, it's kind of boring and, and controversial and everything else, but I think we can really take into account some of the economics of the vitality that we're looking for. I'm going to support what Council Davis is saying. In the February issue of Boston Magazine, there's a big article about Tony Moss, the chef at Craig Young Main, and his operation. And some are borrowed very in the article. For two people, there is two hundred dollars. A two two hundred dollars, uh, and tasting menu over three hundred fifty dollars. But well, that's surely not just Cambridge people, and, and those people must be coming from somewhere. Now, I'm not advocating that we build Cambridge for two hundred dollar meals, but we definitely have a range of things going on here. And the suburban IT who want to come into somewhere interesting must drive, I guess. So uh, the parking. 
And these places do seem to have valet parking. I don't really know where they, oh, some of it, I think, is hosted at places like Forest City, mm -hmm. where they rent space from them. So that's existing parking networks. And during the course of this analysis, we, we asked ourselves exactly that question. And actually, uh, Sue might want to speak to this more, but uh, the traffic department did a, an actual survey of utilization of parking and found that while there is capacity during the daytime, um, at nighttime, um, all the parking, all the public parking in Central Square is actually utilized, it's all full. Um, and they even cross-referenced with uh, the license plates for residents in the area to make sure that it wasn't just residents parking after it became free to park there. And they did not find a lot of um, commonality there. So, so clearly it is people who are not Cambridge residents who are using those parking lots. So we're very cognizant of that. And in any scenario, uh, we would, you know, especially when we talk about redevelopment or parking lots, I think uh, having a much deeper analysis to figure out what the utilization is and making sure that that gets accommodated in some way, uh, that that number of parking spots get accommodated in some way in the future would be an important part of I think you know, one of the things that's uh, easy sometimes for people to forget is um, when you say a surface parking lot should be changed to something different, it doesn't necessarily mean that all the parking goes away. What, what we're really saying is the surface itself should be something which is much more consistent with the goals of what the neighbors are saying they have for the vision of Central Square. But there is still space underneath as there are throughout Cambridge so it's, it's not assumed that all parking will just go away. The she assumption is, is that you will have parking underground that you need to be obviously thinking about how much of the existing parking um, do you need, what does the new use need for parking. And then the other thing I think which is really important is the opportunity for sharing parking. So if you have uh, daytime parking that is used predominantly in the day, and then there's nighttime activities that don't need daytime parking, you may be able to use one space for two different functions um, so that you're trying to utilize the surface space for the kinds of um, buildings and land uses and activities that are consistent with the vision for Central Square. Suzanne? Um, if I may, I think it's also very important to think about pricing strategies because if you provide very low-cost parking or as has been the case until recently, free parking after 6 o'clock, you will inevitably attract people who would have other options. Um, if, if the price of parking was more, it um, made you think about your options. So for example, I might decide to drive from Cambridgeport to either Craig at Maine if I could park there for free. Um, and uh, I might make another decision if uh, there was that the cost of parking was adequately priced. So I, I just I want to make sure that we're not thinking that uh, we're at maximum capacity and for businesses to thrive, we need to provide more parking. Uh, because once you start introducing parking that's priced more reason reasonably, uh, you might find that people will make decisions that are different than the ones they're making now. And don't forget we have bad weather here too. <laughs> Granted, we have bad weather. Granted, we have you know parking, but I think we need to with parking we kind of have to go a little bit past the traditional paradigm of parking. Of this is a business it needs parking. People are changing the way they use cars. People are changing the way they travel. People are walking more. People are using public transportation. It's also been proving if you go everywhere that the more you provide accessible parking, the more will people will drive, which brings more cars. And I mean, you can see everywhere in dense city, in way denser cities than anything you see in Cambridge, where there is no cars, but there's tons of activity. And you can see even in Boston in the North End, the car, yeah, it's a nightmare park, no one drives. People are coming from all over the place. So I think we, I understand this is, Kind of, it's hard to deal with. It's a, it's a change, but I think it's a change that, in the interest of sustainability, in the interest of uh, reducing traffic, in the interest of our environment, 
And in the interest of livability, we need to figure out how to reduce cars, people driving. And in the interest of human health. So from that perspective, I would say that, yes, there should be parking, but maybe we don't need to kind of just over-provide it. Um, because that's how this work is being done. I'm just going to add a very prosaic footnote. Uh, because uh, we, we're not in a position to determine future parking demand uh, in, the study, in the study, but we knew, and because there are quite a range of perspectives on this, we, we used the information we had, I think, to make really pretty good policy recommendations. First of all, uh, because new housing in Cambridge can uh, succeed with much lower parking ratios in the past, and I think we felt that one half a space per unit would, would be adequate and demonstrated to work. Uh, that meant, for example, that if the parking lot were redeveloped, we didn't have to create as much new parking. And when we looked at the economics of redevelopment, we frankly included the cost of replacing most or all of the existing parking places below as part of the cost of development. It, you could all choose not to replace all those spaces. And I think anybody who's used the word shared parking is making a very good point because there are there is parking that could be of great value that is empty at certain times. Um, but but if necessary, then you know if you reach a point where the values are such that you can afford to put parking below and you'll find someone who will redevelop. Those dollars then aren't available for other things you might want, like affordable housing, etc. Should we pass? Uh, this is about parking. So, in that context of the MIT petition, mm -hmm. um,
kind of diversity that has marked Central Square would continue to characterize it going forward. And we looked at a number of tools for doing this. And we looked at it in the context of, over time, retail rents will go up. Incomes in this area are going to go up. Uh, and so we need to find a way, how should I say it, to channel that market, not, not just follow it. Does this make sense? And so we looked at some of the things we talked about, which is um, uh, reserving uh, a certain, uh, at least a third of the space for um, small businesses, I think it was under 1,500 square feet, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And um, a third for larger businesses, which I remember was over 5,000 square feet, or up to 5,000. Yeah. Um, preventing formula retail, which we talked about. Um, Removing the fast food cap, but in the spirit of getting more small food beverage shops. And, and if you want to talk more about that, that might even be where Ron can sort of weigh in on, on how to do that. Um, encouraging more side street retail and services uh, along the streets, probably like Norfolk, obviously Bishop Allen, uh, parts of Green Street. Um, where, and then, uh, Encouraging businesses to uh, where retail won't work, but it's a street that people walk along. Uh, encouraging other activities that help animate the street, and they can be, be able to look in and watch children playing, or or art uses, or nonprofit office space, particularly if it has a relationship to the community, so folks are coming and going from it. And and this is where things uh, uh, I think can really make a difference, but also. Uh, it's gonna, this is where a good, strong city can help with that. Um, exempting ground floors from um, uh, FAR calculation uh, in return for these things. Now, the immediate point is, of course, made. Um, well, what if you get a nice pool store for a year and you've given somebody free you know, space from FAR for 50 years? And I think the answer back, and I think it is the right answer, is that you will be negotiating with each of these folks and will have a chance, uh, based on the development, the goals for that space, et cetera, uh, to work something out. It could be anything from uh, their contributing to a fund over time that would ensure that that space can be subsidized or uh, agreements as to the kinds of users or to, uh, there are a range of mechanisms to do this, but I think it would be hard to make this recommendation in many cities, but it's worth making, and it can be made in Cambridge. Okay, I thought I saw a frown for a second. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. No, not a frown at the idea, but it, it, it's, it's going to take work in this part, but it's really worth it. So then, um, you know, markets are basically places where it's really inexpensive to start a business. There are a lot of very creative folks here, which you all know. Um, and one of the great secrets is empowering people to start businesses these days and providing cheap space where a good idea can take off and succeed with a market and people walking by in a great place it is, can be terrific and done in the right way. It doesn't compete with, but builds interest in the area and therefore business for established businesses. Um, a lot of interest in the winter market was something people talked a lot about. Uh, Farmer's market is something that people talk a lot about. Uh, finding ways to find a more permanent home and maybe the public room would be part of this. Uh, facade improvements uh, clearly matter and you are doing a good job of that. And then we come to something that you all addressed earlier, which I thought was a hugely good point to address, uh, which is uh, really making sure that storefront spaces are filled, and that's in everybody's interest. And the actually, the category I didn't remember to mention was pop-up retail, which is, suppose somebody wants to experiment with something. Uh, just talking to a guy who has an idea for a new national, it doesn't matter the details, but he isn't sure his model is going to work. You know, he could come here and do this for three months and see if it worked. Um, you know, obviously Christmas and Halloween other times are kind of obvious, uh, but people, uh, their ideas, the city can work with them and the, and the, or the <coughs> association and the property owner to make it happen. And particularly if you have an agreement that allows you to do this as part of the development agreement, that's you're even in a stronger position to, to do that. 
Um, uh, we sometimes we use the, the initials BID. We, uh, I would summarize by saying, I think a, a strong business association, and this is probably maybe even overly clear for the presentation, is, is clearly a real health care. Now, clearly it has to be one that is engaged with the residential community, which seems to be happening, and uh, is, it has to be sensitive to the wide range of businesses that are here, and users, etc., which certainly seems to be happening. But when it works, it can work really well. And uh, we would periodically say we think it would be great if it could uh, evolve into a bid, and I, that's, that's another discussion that folks need to have, but I think that would provide a tool for doing many of the things in this process that would be of value to the city and the community. Uh, so then I'll finish, or near finish, with connecting people to the square. Um, this is uh, not just a matter, certainly, of, you know, trees, tree-lined streets, and fixing pavement, and, and uh, all those sorts of things. But it's also a matter of providing an environment that is fun to walk along. You know, it's more interesting to walk past a place where folks are living, and they're coming in out of their doors, and there's a small business at the corner, maybe a little park with folks playing in a parking lot. And the idea of literally weaving Central Square and the Central Square neighborhoods more together into an integral community. It's not that it isn't integral in a social sense now, but physically. So just to really encourage that, we felt was very important. So you didn't feel there was sort of a little bit of a no man's land on, on either side. And, and again, programming activities between neighborhood and Mass Ave can be just a great way to bring folks together. Um, improve wayfinding, for example, to the University Park. park. Um, <clears throat> So, um, I'm going to finish, this is more about strategies than probably goals, but how do we leverage public and private investments? Because this is clearly about tapping into greater value to achieve greater public benefits, as opposed to try and hold that, hold that greater value off because it's viewed as a threat, which it could be. Um, so, uh, we come to the city parking lots, and the city parking lots have actually become quite valuable. Uh, and they, they represent value that you can choose to spend a lot. You can choose to spend it on a parking lot. You can choose to spend it on affordable uh, mixed income housing with parking below at a park. You can, if you can find some more financing, spend it on a park. Uh, but it would appear for lots of reasons that this is a good time to take a look at this asset and make sure that you're really using it the way that is you know, consistent with your mission and quality of life goals. And I think there was pretty broad support for this. And, and, I, and I have to say, one of the great things about this committee was it represented lots of perspectives, business owners, residents, property owners, developers. And so everybody kind of recognized you have to replace parking for businesses to stay alive. And we want to really make sure that we're not encouraging driving. In fact, if you add one to 2,000 residents living within a five minute walk to the square, that, that it can sort of help tip the balance to a more neighborhood oriented um, clientele for businesses. It's a way to encourage more businesses. And one of the nice things about 1 to 2,000 is that's a range where you can really make a tangible impact on a Main Street, particularly if it's less than five minutes away. Does that make sense? So it's, uh, and that can be also a way to balance maybe a trade-off between uh, parking and, and new patrons. Uh, a sustainable future is clearly very important. This is something we're really, I think, Suzanne and the city took, took the lead, and, and um, I don't know if you want to ask, but we certainly have a lot of, of programs in place that we basically took advantage of. Can I just ask if we are the potential to focus on this area for more, for more solar, for more alternative energy, district energy, uh, as we go forward and do, mm -hmm. if we do a zoning recommendations, we can include those kinds of things and ways to look yes. at the area differently in terms of energy? Yes, particularly the Osborne Pine, where you're going to have a lot of change. But yes, any any time you have new buildings near to each other, you can really begin to look at shared energy and, and um, creating an eco district. And, and so, how much development potential is there in the Osborne Triangle after so much has already gone on there? I guess that's I, I don't have a clear picture of that. When I think about Novartis being in there and Shire, what's left? Okay, Novartis has 22 acres. I know they're, they're but aren't they, isn't it all done? Well, I've spoken for. 
Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So we're talking about what to do with the Osborne Triangle. Is it, how much of it is all done? How much of it is left to okay. do? Ben has reminded me, he just basically did a series of test studies, and things are more likely to change than other places. It came to about one to two million square feet, which means... Yes, yeah, so I'm trying. Yeah. So we better get on, on the... Uh, yeah, on the stick on that one. Okay. On the residential part, I yes. haven't heard that mentioned before. The street, oh, I'm yeah. glad to hear. You better pay attention. Yeah, and, and I think it's a great place for residential. It's a great place to create a much more neighborhood friendly Main Street, actually. Taller buildings, not great big buildings, taller buildings at the base of the engagement street with stores and folks across the street. I mean, there, are, there are a lot of real opportunities there. There are also yeah. opportunities um, along the mass. Edge of the Osborne Triangle, if you can think of, um, there's a number of uh, infill, but yeah, like Korean store or um, adjacent to the um, museum. I mean, you know, that area, there are some, and then you have the U Hall site, for instance. So, so those are some of the sites that would offer potential. Is the U Hall site flower and Oh, the, uh, oh, the other you are. Well, you know, what I think uh, in this whole vision isn't bold enough is that there is the other side of Mass Ave. And so when you get to the corner where Paradise is, everything going, going toward the river is like you turn out of your mind as if it's not there. If MIT were good enough to give some one of those industrial looking buildings over to some sort of a market or art galleries or some, I mean, because that's a very real neighborhood that none of us is going to. It's, it's the, the earliest for a city, I would call it. It's just the people don't go there because they don't want to be there because there's nothing there for us. But it's a valid part of the city and it's vast. The area between Mass Ave going down to the, the Albany Street shelter is quite a Hike, then most of us won't hike because there's nothing there for us. Uh, and we do have a large institutional owner who could make decisions that would uh, enliven a whole quadrant of the city that, that is not discussed hardly anywhere because it's so walled off in our minds because there's nothing there inviting us. What, what if you got a on the ground floor? <laughs> any destination thing can enliven an the area in a way that you I'm getting, want. I'm getting cheers from the audience. Okay. I, I would suggest, when I'm experiencing working with this committee, that any part of Cambridge you want to have, who wasn't in our study area, they would be willing to take on. <laughs> okay. well, well, what I'm thinking of is, you know, we mentioned the markets in D.C., but this south of Washington, solo market in the south end, is extraordinary good and it really is operating in what was a dead area and our area like that is this area I'm trying to refer to. Uh, we think we should build a uh, dream the bigger dream. Mm -hmm. So let me just uh, frame we have uh, more or less officially another 20 minutes and I think you've completed your presentation? No. Close to it. Close to it. So, so uh, so I still uh, think it's a question I raised earlier that I still haven't uh, heard the answer to is we're trying to increase the, uh, the housing to drive the increase in the retail and the street like vibrancy that we want to see and that we need more people living nearby to support the retail locally that we'd like to see on the ground floor. I guess I'm wondering, from, you know, when you talk about raising the height limits, like that is, if you calculate so if we raise the height limits, how much housing we get, whether or not that is sufficient to make the kind of market difference that yes. we want to see. Yeah, okay, so there's a, we, we actually in our office have been very interested in that question, and I'm sorry, I was, you asked it, and I should have answered it. Um, and it's been a lot of time. Actually, you know, we first did it as part of this, the uh, Eastern Cambridge study a number of years ago. And worked with Pam McKinney to uh, basically, and we tested this again and again, getting the same numbers, to basically say that, um, particularly for the kind of retail that everybody is thinking about, I think, uh, residents are a much better, are a, a much more potent source of, of market than uh, our workers, but certainly um, commuters, so that they can help. Um, that uh, based on rents and costs of business and a whole series and income,
incomes, disposable incomes, what really matter here, uh, that between one and 2,000 housing units uh, is enough to do a number of things. One is to create a threshold of disposable income to support. This has to be within five to 10 minutes. So uh, to interest uh, developers in creating a new block of Main Street, for example. That's not the issue here. That doesn't provide all the support, but it's the core of support that then can support a destination that others come to. Um, in, for a place like Central Square, this what, the one to 2,000 is a threshold where you really begin to see a tangible difference for existing businesses and demand for neighborhood-oriented businesses because you, you've basically given it, uh, a, uh, a, you've given a critical mass uh, boost to local support, and it's within preferably a five-minute walk. That's a five-minute a five walk, less a 10-minute walk, very little beyond that is where you can really make a difference when you add housing for Main Street. And, and people may walk more here, but boy, does that hold true. So you, because you're talking about like the, the distance in terms of walking, I guess I'm wondering in terms of the, the number of new housing units. Yeah, building. one, one to two thousand. I think we, that was part of. Um, I mean, if we had only gotten to five hundred, we probably would have had a very different set of attitudes in terms of discussion. If we got to four thousand, oh my gosh! Uh, but the fact that one to two thousand, probably close to two thousand, feels right at least in terms of uh, many of the things that the committee supported. I think. Uh, led us to feel that we could confidently say that that uh, uh, new mixed income housing would have a very real impact at, at this scale. Is that a question? The one to two thousand, one thousand is a threshold. If you don't take one thousand within a five minute walk, you're probably not making a huge difference. Uh, if you're getting three or four thousand, you're making a very big difference. One to two thousand, you're going to have a real impact. It, it would attract more businesses. It would change the nature of businesses because it's. Uh, uh, particularly restaurants that serve that market, things like that. So we want one to two thousand new units of housing within a five-minute five walk, ideally five-minute walk. And this is the height that gets us to that. Yeah. Yeah. This, this essentially, it's, it's a bigger, it's a longer space, though. I mean, so when you talk about five-minute walk, actually walking from one end to the square to yeah. the other is more than. Yeah. Once you get five people minutes. there, they keep walking. It's it's walking to a place. People just don't. Everyone thinks they walk more than they do. Uh, Mark, and this is um, uh, Mark, this is awesome. I, I just, um, I think on the zoning issue relative, I think it was inherent in the council's question, is um, right now, um, I think in the recommendations from the committee, spoke to increasing density and height for housing. And the idea of that is, and, and this is the other question I think you were asking, is that, you know, lab space is $65 a foot, and office space is $43 a foot, and housing, is half that. So if you want a developer to build housing under the current zoning, they won't. They won't. And if you want them to build, if you want more housing, it won't fit in the zoning envelope we have. So if you want housing, the zoning implications of more housing are, probably we haven't done enough actually, but it increase the discrepancy between the amount you're allowed to build with office, land, and housing, one, and two, allow higher heights for housing. That's why those are in the recommendations. Thank you. Uh, Susan, just on that point. Wait, Susan, I recognize Susan. Okay, please. Um, I'm Susan um, I just wanted to. Could you stand up, Susan? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could you change places, Susan? Um, <laughs> I guess I just wanted to, uh, to unveil a little bit of minority opinion on the committee and just make sure that there's not this monolithic that believes that we're. All 100% behind us. Um, some of us had questions about these parking issues, very significant and serious questions about parking issues and questions about the allowable height and density increases. And I think one thing that made it okay for me to sleep at night was uh, realizing that this can't happen across the whole square, that there are only certain parcels that it's appropriate to have this kind of height and density, and that um, it's not going to all of a sudden be that Mass Ave is you know, 10 stories high all the way from Kendall Square. Square. So I think, you know, as much as we're making recommendations for changes, I, I still think we're going to be looking at individual parcels and what is appropriate mm -hmm. for those parcels. Yeah, that's a very good point. And I mean, I'll be the first to say, it, the 
stuff without any ability that in 10 years, I mean, the world is changing faster, society is changing faster, our economy is changing faster than it ever has, and you'll probably want to take another look in 10 years and see what's worked and what do you want to change. Well, I think that's what I'm saying. This is um, sort of piggybacking on all of this, and this is about the point that you have up there about transfer of development rights. So in the point before, you're saying raise the, the zoning to um, 140, 260 feet, and then would there be the transfer of development rights from another parcel on top of that 160? Is that the way we work? Oh, I'm getting different. Yes. Not, not greater height. There would be greater if they are in that. We did allow for 20 feet of additional heights to accommodate also, the right. transferred yeah. okay. density. Well, so you would cap that it would only be 20 additional feet that they could be transferred. That's so if you could have two parcels each donating 10 feet, I don't know if that would if that would necessarily oh, work. Well, it's, they would donate square footage. I don't mean donate, they would Well, I mean they would transfer right. square footage, and the height is just to accommodate that square footage. So it isn't that if one parcel donates, it would be 10 feet. So, and then the, the, the parcel that donated or the transferred development rights to a now larger building, how do you document that those rights are going for that parcel? The, the way we have this, uh, we have this provision already in the zoning ordinance for other parts of the city, and we imagine that this would follow a similar path. Um, which is that there is a special permit on both the, uh, the donating and the receiving parcel so that then it gets reported in the deed for both parcels and cannot be easily modified. So it would just be easily modified? Well, I mean, it's, in the, it's in the deed, but if somebody um, gets, a, gets a modification to their special amendment, when they do their special permit, then it gets a okay. okay, so we have a, a few people. Um, I just want to take the temperature of the room for uh, how much longer we want to go. Uh, as long as it takes, uh, another half an hour. Members wish to speak up? Well, we're all supposed to stop, stop at 7 30. We haven't finished the presentation, presentation yet. Yeah, I'm probably going to dinner at 6 45, so I don't know. You are already done, right? Well, you're, co you're cooked. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you think we could move on to finish the presentation and then pick up pick up comments then and see how we go? Yeah. Keep speaking along. Yeah. Okay, Iran is saying something. She often says to me, move faster. Okay, so, <laughs> so here, this is about a variety of heights. I think ultimately mattered more than many. I mean, heights certainly mattered, and fair to Susan's question, it was more a, an assurance that this produced variety. Uh, so we looked at what you get with uh, 55 to 60 foot height, stepping back to uh, Bishop Allen. This is, uh, I always forget the corner of what it was. No, no, yeah. Um, okay. Um, we then said, well, what if we raised it um, and still um, had a setback and enough to create a larger, uh, more public space, some middle income housing, and um, uh, we then looked at, well, what if we went to the 140 feet foot, which I think we're doing, predominant, in most cases, the limited, the, the tender match is 140 feet. Um, what, and what we did was look at the economics of these buildings to say, uh, if we didn't, in other words, if you let somebody come in and build 140 feet and you don't ask for anything back, then whoever owns that piece of land gets the full increment in value from 60 feet and 140 feet. Okay. Uh, if you say instead, you have to pay for a larger public space, maybe pay for the public room, um, uh, do a deal with the city so you have some very low cost retail space and you brought an existing business in that was threatened someplace else, things like that, uh, and you want middle income housing, that this increment would be or a good chunk of it used to pay for that. So basically, you are transform, transferring it from a, um, what's the term, a jackpot, there's another term, to the owner into public benefits. Windfall. windfall, thank you, yeah. To turn your windfall into public benefits. Uh, this is also, I think, as, as our architect colleague very well put it, uh, making more real for housing 
the FARs that are around. So this involves a very little increase in actual developable area, but it allows the heights and building configurations, in most cases, that would allow that FAR to be realized as, as a housing. And there's 140, what, how much of this FAR do we have? 30. 30. What is it now? Is it? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. It goes up from uh, 2.75 for commercial to 4.0 for residential. Speeding right along. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, so then we said, well, what does this look like if you're coming from other perspectives? So here we are uh, looking down Norfolk, and this assumes that uh, uh, this is the, let's say the Nagar development, and nothing has happened on the city on parking lot. Uh, here we have a 45 foot tall building with nothing, and the, the permitted height, no matter what, would be 45 feet along um, Bishop Allen. Uh, here we, I'm sorry, this is 45 feet set not on Bishop Allen, but a new development just on Mass Ave. This is then the 45 foot, foot building on Bishop Allen with nothing taller on the site. Uh, this assumes probably, this is probably about 80 or 100 feet on the site, um, uh, set back based on the requirements of the of the, the study. And this would be if we went to the full maximum height and, and set back. Um, and we said, well, you could have a you could have a park. There are various things one could do. And um, this is just giving a sense of walking along the street and what different things we're looking for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation.
about places like my native Detroit that they are asking the neighbors to move out of the neighborhood because they can provide no services and the city is shrinking and it's the exact different paradigm. So please understand that in the real world, there are different, and to be fighting MIT about development and fighting for a city is just in these circumstances, and this is, I'm talking about America's 10 biggest cities, and what, how five of them dropped off the list and they went to the south, and southeastern cities moved on. For the American context, this is a wonderful discussion. So I hope everybody is treated to the wonder that it is. Um, there was a recent Globe article about the downtown bid and how much money they were going to put in things, and they detailed what the money was. And the money is for things like, I want us to get on the good foot here and realize that the city bought some tables and chairs and put them in some interesting spots, like Carl Baron Plaza, uh, if only in the good weather we could do some quite achievable things that don't cost a lot. We just need to own the stuff. And, and the, the, the committee that I chair, which is public celebration, we're planning to make a New York trip to go to Bryant Park and several other spots to see if we can catch them in action and see if they're good ideas that we should be stealing that are real available. And just the last thing, from Red Ribbon to C2, has come the real new idea, and I'm going to give this idea to, to Brent. He really is the first person in my recollection who brought up this middle class housing that you could have today. Post rent control, I didn't believe it could ever happen. But we have to spend a lot more time on that idea. And I think in some preliminary ways, I've tried to get some people who want to, I mean, David Posen has built some of this kind of housing and try to get him at the table. Uh, there's another professor in the university, uh, in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning, Phil Thompson, who knows something about it. He knows something about a 200, quarter of a billion dollar uh, community betterments agreement with Harlem, where between Harlem and Columbia, which involves masses of housing for regular people. So I do think that this is a, a, a missing thing. I cannot thank the committee members enough for the time and the love, attention, and energy you have given us. And we want to know something from uh, our community development staff about the next steps. Who takes the baby from here uh, is a very important, I, I think, uh, big question because it, it won't do itself. We are, um, we've started to talk to the planning board about the zoning recommendations that have emerged from here, and uh, we'll be working with them over the next few months, and we hope to get a zoning petition based on these recommendations to you, hopefully, prior to the summer meeting. And how about the non-zoning recommendations? Will they come at the same time, things that are related to programming and so on that are not necessarily zoning recommendations? Okay. I heard many things that sounded more like management and programming. Sure. Or in zoning. They, they will be going to city manager and all of the various departments who, you know, uh, CDD worked with DBW, Human Services, um, uh, as well as an Arts Council, a lot of other departments uh, during the course of this study. And uh, these recommendations have gone to, uh, and will We'll continue to have conversations with those groups. If the council is interested in any specific uh, pieces, we're happy to come back here and have further conversations about those. Um, and of course, the SBA has, been, uh, has already started to, uh, to partner with all the agencies. And the, the Osborne Triangle is coming also in the zoning? Because I think that that uh, is obviously emerges something pretty urgent to do. Okay, let's go here and uh, yeah. Um, so I was just wanting to say that uh, one of the things that I think we really need to think about also is that if we build a new family housing in the square, which I think is a fantastic idea, we also have to make the square seem like a place that families can imagine living. I think that my family is very unusual family that we actually like moving in the nitty-gritty of the square, but a lot of families would say, well, where's the safe 
park for my children? Where are my children going to eat? Where is my teenager going to hang out? Where is the fantastic library like that we have on Broadway? I can't picture a family living there. And so as we look at car clubs and retail and public spaces, we should be thinking, how are we going to make families be able to picture themselves living here? Because I think a lot of people don't. Thanks. Um, Gavin, and then Mr. Baker. So, um, can I have a microphone? Yeah. I hope I can do it in the so she's easier. So I just want to make um, two <clears throat> minor points that were slightly, perhaps I have a little washed over in a very fast presentation. We said, you know, I have 16 months to need, so doing this in two hours is pretty quick. Uh, but one thing that I think was important to talk about is that when we are talking about public spaces and public programming, there was also an emphasis on cultural institutions using those, sure. not just markets. So it wasn't just about having a farmer's market, but it was about having cultural institutions and displays and, and things like that. Um, and we also talked about part of the public park and about, you know, specific location and celebrating the identity of the square and really emphasizing what Central Square's culture is now and was in the past. Um, and so that, that was a part of it. I also just want to point out that when uh, David Dixon was going through the, the list of the participants in the committee and talking about how like, these different groups who are uh, Featured, it was, you know, business owners and landlords and developers. Um, and I want to point out that the largest single group was residents. Um, and many of the residents are people like Susan and I who both live in the neighborhood and represent our institution. But overwhelmingly, the largest group was residents of the neighborhood. And so that, I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Okay. And I apologize, I thought I mentioned residents first, but this is, and, and less than any, but I'm sure you would realize this, but all the things that where people are expressing a degree of consensus, even from different perspectives, didn't start out that way. There were a lot of very tough discussions with people who did bring different perspectives and people who really listened to them. So I think it's also important, I've had conversations with uh, you know, Brian and his staff earlier this week about this, and I'm saying it as if things that I think since the Forest City debates started last year, that I think there's a lot of people who sat on this committee, and as Gavin just said, you had 16 months of conversations. That, you know, for me, was always sort of the beginning of that you were, you were doing a really important foundation work to then begin the conversation with the larger community. And I think it's just going to be a really, what I'm really waiting to hear, particularly from CBD, because I think that's where the lead needs to come from, is how are we going to do it differently? How are we going to involve larger members of the, of the community Using this as a great foundation to begin discussion, but to really just do it differently than we have. The traditional ways of sort of community engagement, community meetings aren't, um, for a lot of reasons, really capturing the conversations that need to happen. The very conversations that all of you on this committee have had the incredible opportunity to hash out differences in ideas and, and thoughts. That same level of intensity needs to be given to the larger community. And I just think about there are people who I have an enormous amount of respect for. I have known for probably more than half my life, and we have a very shared common values of what we think Cambridge is about, what we hope the future of Cambridge will be about, who gets to live here, what kind of experiences neighbors get to have with one another through all the various institutions and, and community ways in which we, we interact and build community and build a sense of this is where I want to stay, this is what I care about, and this is why I'm willing to spend all these additional hours outside of work family to make this community so great. Um, but we have very different visions of how to get there, and that's what this process is. And this has been a very, I, I think for many people, this has, um, you know, this process has been so important, and I think it was been important. It's also, I think it's been a, I don't think it would be um, only my experience say, it's been a very painful experience at times to have people who really do love being neighbors or love living in a city together and represent all the very best why this city is so interesting to live in, who have found themselves in very tense um, moments with people who they just have had to walk away from each other and, and not be able to have the kind of conversations and the, and the ability to have trust to stay at the table and to really hash out ideas. Um, and so I say that I'm having that experience with people who I just care deeply about their vision and, and value the work that they have done to make this community something that I have just loved living in and growing up in and choosing to raise children, it really is incumbent upon the city council and, and more pointedly CBD to find ways, alternative ways, ways that really speak to how
how people live their lives today and interact with one another and work and then create civic time to really be able to lead that process. Having a flyer that says the meeting, you know, um, at the Area 4 Youth Center at 2 o'clock on Saturday, that cannot be, that has to be the serious bonus to all the other ways that we do this. Um, how do we get people throughout the various tables to really interact with each other? I think that a lot of ideas I know that I've shared with the CBD, I know my colleagues must have shared ideas to their various ways. And there's a lot out there, there's a lot of research out there, and there's a lot of um, past um, practices that have shown alternative ways of community engagement. And I just want to say that, so for those of you who've been either on the committee or who've been attending all of these meetings now, I, I want to say thank you, because I know it's been exhausting. It's been exhausting for um, those of you who are, who are in the audience, those of you who are here, and a lot of community who aren't able to attend. But just to think about um, who gets to decide what the future of Cambridge is about. Because when we talk about creating spaces, and we talk, I mean, I think about, again, zoning. Zoning is one tool, but it's a really important to, tool that builds structures that allow us to actually live our lives and, and live the kinds of communities and the kinds of spaces and do the kinds of things that represent the values and the vision um, of what our experiences are and who gets to have what kind of experiences. So I, I just, I'm really just going to keep pushing to say that because I've, I've, I've been having this conversation, I feel like since this really started taking place a year and a half ago, I'm still not seeing it. It's, you know, it's important that we do this, and, and you're right, Deb, it's only a two hour conversation, so we need to have the council needs to continue having these conversations because I think the other tricky side, and I'm in a really great position, I'm not running for re-election to the council, right? <laughs> I'm just saying this. But as we get closer to re-election, and even the debate about whether or not this gets televised, right? The nastiness for me around that, I, um, Mark, we get the letter tomorrow that will come to you from Cambridge Day where it's, you said something in the article that sort of, it's not this word, but the backlash of not wanting this round table to be um, televised is that other people are going to come televise it. But that's not my point. I, I, in fact, said that I thought if we wanted to have it televised, it should be another board that's coming. I'm not opposed to it being televised. What, I was, what I'm concerned about is keeping the integrity of the council of the rules in place. And round tables are about being confident that all stakeholders can come and have a really good conversation. I think that what's happening here, you can bring all the cameras you want in, but what we'll see over time is that to usurp the council rules that allow for a round table, you'll just see less frank conversation happen. That, that's all. But I do think that frank conversation, and maybe it, it won't take place in a, in a two hour period in a council chamber anyway, and it really should be taking more in the neighborhood, the one-on-one -on -one conversations, the small group conversations, the large group conversations, um, that kind of in, in intentional um, interaction and exchange of ideas and a, a willingness to sort of tough it up with one another. Because what we're talking about is worth talking about with one another. It's worth hurting each other's feelings and finding ways to reconnect them and not feel so hard about our different visions and seeing um, are there ways to sort of have a shared vision um, with a different, with multiple paths to get to. And I, I'm saying that my not ready for the election makes it easier for me to kind of push into that conversation because I think as you move into an election year, quite frankly, it's harder to be willing to sort of take those big, bold steps that allow for that kind of intense conversation that has already, I think, had a lot of peaks and a lot of valleys. Um, and those valleys aren't, haven't felt comfortable for a lot of people. A lot of people here and a lot of people out. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep doing it. And there's a lot of people who are willing to keep doing that. So, um, I, I guess I just feel like I'm in a position to keep pushing us to do this because it's it's so essential that at the end of the day, everybody who loves this community and is willing to put the time in, um, if given the opportunity that, that makes sense to them, um, that they have uh, a voice in this and it's a real meaningful voice and that um, it's worth it. It's worth it. We love the city. We I think all of us talk about, you know, there's no other city I can imagine in this country that I would want to live in. Um, and I've always said that. And I I may have grown up here, but I choose to still live here. I choose to raise my children here, and um, like so many of you. So uh, I'm just going to keep encouraging us to be willing to find additional ways than just tonight. Because this tonight isn't going to get us. It, it's a good start. It's a good. It, it's important, but we have to really. Again, you know, Brian's going to keep shaking his head because I keep saying this, um, and he knows we've had some good conversations. But CDD really, really, really needs to come here visionary um, recommendations to the council. 
based on, I think, a lot of input you've already gotten about sort of wedges and timeline. Um, so that's what I'll say. Thank you. Councilor Reeves? Yeah, I, I think uh, with the House of Decker, the, the, the importance of the listening part is there, but I do want to say that a particular strength about the C2 process is that it got preceded by the Red River process, which was also two years, which really created a, pe a group of citizens and, and business owners and building owners. Uh, they got a foundation of uh, uh, concepts about how cities and places are made, et cetera, and so on. And I think one of the huge benefits of Red River when it says a number of these people got to travel and look at DC and see things together and understand that there are places that are doing it better and, and that the only visions we have can't, don't have to be the ones that are right here. And so what I see, I'm not sure, it seems traditionally you have a charrette, you invite everybody in, uh, CDD seems to be fond of the notion, you know, we have 36 meetings, so that means that we heard from people. Um, I agree with you, it is the election year, but I kind of hope the election is a kind of referendum on where we're going or not going. And because I think there's very, if the vision is not to change anything, then it doesn't we should have a different group in government who can realize nothing. Uh, so it, 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 it's, 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 um, <laughs> I, I mean this uh, seriously, and I also don't believe that we can just sort of listen to the same kind of people on every project and believe that we've heard from the people because the demographics of the city are vastly changed. And in Cambridge, 76% of the people have lived here five years or less. Um, that's a lot of people who we haven't heard from. But they seem to be going along with what it is we're trying to do with the best of our abilities and the, the, the moments of our lives. So I'm pleased that trying to hear everybody is important, but I do think at the end of the day, why you have a city council is to come up with a policy that will reduce the place and the quality of life that most people want. And, and I think we have been, in terms of city surveys, of people's happiness with the direction of things, in terms of, I mean, I'm old enough now, I, when I first brought up about having uh, outdoor dining, I was told that would be impossible forever because it was a public sidewalk and you couldn't have alcohol there, you could never close mass, and look how far we've come. Um, so I, I think we've been about the dynamic of change because I think that's the, the, the chain of human existence we're in. And, uh, but I think we shall always need to be listening. That's the job of the elected position. Any other closing comments from folks? I think the closing is what we're about right now. That's why. Very briefly, and I said a lot of this at the last meeting that we had. I, I want to thank all of the uh, members of the public who participated in the process. I think this is, um, this is really the beginning of the dialogue now for uh, for the city council going forward, and you've given us an awful lot to think about, and, and uh, I think this is really a very, very exciting time for Central Square and for the city of Cambridge, and, and one that I um, look forward to um, a lot more dialogue uh, as we go forward. And I, you know, I, I, I want to say I think you look at this, and, and I think this is what you were getting at, Henrietta, when we talked about this at the meeting, the last meeting that we had, is how do we see, if we come to agreement that this is a vision that we want to see, how is it that we can actually affect that change? And, you know, what I don't want to see happen is all the good work that people did have the report and the recommendations placed on a shelf somewhere and 10 years from now, us saying the same thing and calling Dave back and, and uh, uh, saying we need to do this again. I think what we really need to figure out is how with the complexities of the square, the ownership, a lot of small owners, how can we actually get people together and affect change? And that's what I'm, I, I think is gonna be the biggest challenge that we have and one that I look forward to solving. And, and along with what you were saying, I think you're talking about
about the zoning coming forward and recommendations going to different departments, but this idea of the city uh, using its power of its land um, is not something that we have an action set for just yet. Um, here we are only with what is it, five or six parking lots um, in critical places in the square that might be, and instead of pointing at everybody else and saying, why don't you, and you name, fill the name of the owner, why don't you do something? Well, I think we need to point the fingers at ourselves and say to ourselves, well, why don't we do something? Uh, why don't we say, look for an RFP or an RFQ that says, how would you make use of this to make a development happen? I that, think that's, 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 that's exactly my point, that I, I think that we are a major, the city of Cambridge Here is a go. major player in this, and I think that, you know, somebody mentioned it earlier, but, you know, about a library and having a great library in Central Square. You know, we have a library in Central Square. I'm not certain that we would all agree that it's a great library. And so I, I think there are a lot of ways that we can pool resources and do an RFP process, engaging, you know, there's limitations of what the Cambridge City Council can do as a government entity. And that might mean pulling in another planning group to help us to be able to be the conduit for this change. But that's a dialogue we have to have. And an action step that's not bounded by zoning and other referrals. So, looks like I can say thank you very much to everyone. Uh, thank you for all the participants in the Central Square uh, Committee, and thank you to, the, uh, to all of you who came this evening to hear this meeting. And thank you, of course, to the for doing another great job and the city staff.